All right, so um, I want to welcome everyone. I am thrilled. We are thrilled with the turnout today. It's amazing. Um, this is our first après cours for the Social Integration Anglo Network. Merci, Richard Pechot, for helping us with that, too. Um, and I'm going to kick things off by I'll introduce myself. My name is Avi Spector. I'm a receipt consultant with the Riverside School Board. I work in ed tech, but recently in the last three years, I've been welcomed with open arms into this amazing network of social integration teachers working closely with Matthew Kennedy, Jennifer Campbell, and many other of you. Um, I also want to give a quick shout out to our friends in the Integration Sociale uh, in the French sector. Uh, they've been really open uh, to having us being part of their APRECOR and their initiatives. And I think Stephanie Arel est là aujourd'hui, so bonjour. And I believe May 11th is their next APRECOR too. And we've learned a lot by being in that network also. Um, so really with this APRECOR, to give you an overview of the format, today we really want to make sure that it's time well spent. Um, th this APRECOR is going to be short to the point. Uh, I'll give you an overview of what we're doing today. So to give you an agenda, to begin, we're going to be doing a short into introduction, what we're doing right now. And then we're going to be modeling a tool named GatherTown that we think really has great potential for SI students. After we play with GatherTown for about 10 minutes, we're going to be coming back into the Zoom. And then we're going to hear from our panel of expert educators. We're going to listen to Matthew Kennedy, Stephanie Huguet, Monique Laflamme, uh, Kira Bratton, Hannah Quinn, all around the topic of teaching sexuality in a social integration context. And before we jump into Gather Town, uh, we really wanted to explain the rationale. Why are we doing this for the first 10 minutes? And we think it's, it's something you got to see. So in a nutshell, Gather Town is a web conferencing software like Zoom. But the way it looks and the way it works is really interesting. It kind of looks like an old 8-bit Nintendo game. Um, and it's free. For any time you have less than 25 students, uh, they can jump in and they're in this virtual environment uh, that really looks like a game, but they can move around and interact uh, with other participants in the room. It's more than just a video conferencing software. And why this is so neat? Well, you know, Matthew and I have been talking a lot about it. And I think it's, it's well, we think it's really an authentic way for students to practice social interactions in a safe environment. Um, and again, that gaming element with many of our students are familiar with, they'll be right at home in there. Uh, but you don't have to be a gamer to use it either, as you'll see in a moment. Um, I know our receipt team, we've used it at conferences. Um, it kind of replicates that Sheraton Laval experience when you first walk in and you have your coat and you're talking to everybody, which we miss a lot, you know, this year since everything's on Zoom. Um, and it's not a Zoom, which is kind of refreshing in itself. Another big piece of Gather Town that we really like this tool is that for student agency. It really gives the students the ability to walk around this video game map and talk to who they want to talk to. You're not stuck in that big room uh, talking to everybody all at the same time. So we're going to model it today as an icebreaker activity. And we're just going to allow you to play with it and experiment with it to, to see what kind of implications it has uh, for your teaching in SI. And last but not least, one of our, my favorite reasons, Matthew is so excited about it and been talking about it so much. We're like, we're doing it. We're doing it in our first FLA core. So there you go. Um, is there anything that you want to add, Matthew, before I have anyone jump into the gather town? Okay, so what I'm going to show before we jump in is I find it's helpful, rather than just throwing you guys into the deep end, is I'm going to do a, a quick screen share. It's going to be no more than two minutes just to show you what this looks like, okay? I'm about to give you a link, and you're going to see something that looks like this. It's going to ask you to enter your name and to customize your avatar. Um, then after that, there's a big green button that says join. Now, when you're in, you're going to see this beautiful rooftop um, area. And you can walk around in this area and start talking to people. You're going to start somewhere at the bottom of the screen. And you're going to use the arrow keys on your keyboard to move around. So any of these open spaces, if you can see where I'm pointing with my mouse cursor, these are just public conversations. Whenever you're talking, wherever you're walking near somebody, it's going to automatically open up your, your webcam and people will hear you. And the further you are away from them, uh, the softer your voice will be and the softer the picture. Um, for those of you who want to try having private conversations, these little tables, if you walk near them and you see these two chairs, you can have private conversations. We also included a private group conversation area, whereas if you work and if you walk anywhere in this white square, um, you can have a private conversation with the people in here, but the people outside the square will not hear you. 
Um, the way you'll know that you're in a private space, it's going to say you have entered a private space at the bottom of the screen. So, you know, again, we want you to play with it and see what it's like. We also wanted to show you that you can have interactive elements, one of which is um, we put our Quebec SI website on this little computer over here. So if you walk up to it and hit the X key, you can actually look through um, the Quebec SI website. Last but not least, that's a bad picture of me, but last but not least, in the right-hand corner, you have a little picture of yourself and you can toggle the microphone on and off. And we want you guys to have fun. All right, so what we're gonna suggest, I am about to paste this link into the chat of the Zoom. You guys are gonna be in there for about five, 10 minutes. And I'm gonna make an announcement in there saying, okay, everyone, we're gonna go back to the Zoom, okay? So then you'll close the gather town. So it works as follows. You're gonna click on the chat link that I'm about to paste in, close your Zoom, just so there's no interference with microphones on Zoom and all that stuff, enjoy gather town, and then I'll tell you to come back in here. All right, so here you go. There's the link for the gather town, close your Zoom, and I'll see you guys in gather town. So while we're waiting for everybody to uh, come back in, I hope you guys enjoyed that. We, uh, with so many people showing up, we could have used a, a bigger space, but I still think you got to see the potential of having that video game map. And they have maps that are way bigger, public parks, um, all sorts of things like that. But we chose the more intimate venue, but there's, there's a lot of us here, which is a good problem to have. Yeah, that was fun. So we just used that as like a bit of a, a nice breaker. So thanks for setting that up, Abby. And I really think that in social integration, there's a lot of, uh, you know, a, there'll be a lot of, uh, you know, good pedagogical reasons to use this resource, like practicing social interactions, like in a safe environment. Um, you can share resources in there that the students can explore, right? So like allowing them to have that agency to sort of choose what activity they'd like to participate in. And especially, you know, with Zoom, you know, everything's on Zoom and, uh, you know, and we're online. Just that idea that students can move around, right? Um, even in the classroom, if you're doing hybrid, you know, lots of times fo uh, folks are stuck at their desks. So I think um, there's a lot to be done, you know, in the current context with uh, Gather Town as well. Um, but now we're going to um, head into, you know, uh, the workshop proper and begin talking to you about teaching sexuality in SI contexts. Uh, so my name is Matthew Kennedy. I'm a consultant for inclusive education in the adult sector at Lester Pearson School Board. Um, and presenting with me uh, today, we have um, Monique Laflam. So, okay. So um, as I was saying, we have Monique Laflam, who is a teacher and a music therapist um, in the Endeavor program. We've got Stephanie Hege, who is a teacher uh, for Endeavor and she works in our WIA, our WIA partnership program. We've got Hannah Quinn, who is a PhD uh, a student, uh, so a doctoral candidate at the U of T. And um, Kira Bratton is a uh, teacher in the social integration program called Endeavor uh, at Place Cartier. So I'm just going to get us started today. We have a bunch of cool resources and um, units to share with you today. Um, I'm starting with this quote that we actually got just the other week from Isabel Aino. She is a prominent sexologist in Montreal, perhaps one of the best known um, in the province and has done um, lots of international work as well. So this, is, this came right from her con uh, the conference we attended last week. Uh, and she says, uh, what we're doing is we are not pushing sexual behaviors. We are teaching students how to protect themselves. When students don't know the information, they become more vulnerable. So I think that's just really important, right? We are, not, um, we are not teaching students to have sex. We are teaching students to be safe, right? So much of this is just about consent, permission, okay? Bodily autonomy, saying no, um, and communication, right? So these are some of the elements we're really, really uh, striving at. And I, and I think um, Isabel uh, Ino is really tapping into that as well. And it's how she sort of moves through her, her practice. So um, Monique, can you give us a little bit of background on this? Uh, talk to yes. us about our approach, context, and data, please. Absolutely, thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, so as Matthew mentioned, our approach um, has been anti-oppressive, um, sex and body positive, and very much consent-based. So as he explained, it's not just about sex. We're really working on um, approaching the topic of consent in a real world way. So not just having to do with sexuality, but also in every other facet of our students' lives. 
So our lessons have been designed with our current reality in mind as well. Some of our students are still learning remotely from home and we very much are aware that they may not be able to have complete privacy. Um, so we really kept that in mind as we were designing our lessons um, for group contexts. And some of the activities are suggested for students to be able to ask questions privately. Um, I'll go over one of those awesome activities uh, in a minute. Our intent is to present the information in, accessible, in an accessible way. So we're not expecting or or even um, we're not pushing teachers to have all of the answers. Um, if a student requires attention for personal issues or they're having some trouble, we really worked hard on, on making sure we have the resources to uh, refer students to find some one-on-one -on -one help for whatever particular issues they're experiencing. So we address um, subject in the curriculum as a way to start conversations. And we're really looking to influence the after effect of these conversations, starting with our students at school, but also with the intent of having them start conversations in their wider communities. Thank you, Monique. Yeah. So um, this slide is meant to address sort of questions we've already started receiving from parents, from teachers, from folks who are interested in what we've been working on. Um, and it's why we need to teach this, why it's important. So these are a bit preemptive, but hopefully they speak to you a little bit as well. Um, first being that we're very aware of the very troubling, uh, disturbing statistics surrounding our particular clientele and, and sexual violence. And I'll get to some of those statistics in a few slides. Um, there's this presumption of incapacity or lack of interest on the part of adults with intellectual disabilities um, in the topic of sex and sexuality. And this has to do with very long held stereotypes and assumptions about either um, disabled people being considered hypersexual or not sexual at all. Um, but either way, sexuality, um, as it relates to typically uh, to sexuality, is, is typically framed as a problem, right? So we want to think about this in a different way. Um, as you know, all of the curriculum tends to promote autonomy that you're teaching, but sometimes we gloss over sexual and bodily autonomy, so it's really being centered in this particular sex ed curriculum. For number four, we, we know from the research that there is um, a limited access to sex ed con um, content that is specifically geared towards disabled and intellectually disabled folks in general. And that's for a variety of reasons, whether it be because of parental control, um, processes of infantilization, um, the fact that some of that content may not be modified to meet the particular access needs of the folks that we're working with or that the sex ed content just simply doesn't address the lived experience of disabled people in a variety of ways. So number five, this content is really meant to respond to, like Monique said, a real world interest that we've seen on the part of students as well. As you'll see, a lot of the activities are meant to address things that you know, teachers are already seeing or hearing in the classroom setting, in the hallways, you know, in the schoolyard, that kind of thing. So they're really meant to address very real needs and questions. And then lastly, six and seven, of course, the government mandates that we teach, teach sex ed. And of course, sexuality is a human right. And these are very fundamental concepts that have guided how we've worked through this curriculum. So now that I've started talking already, I'll tell you a little bit about myself. So as Matthew said, my name's Hannah. I'm a PhD candidate in anthropology and sexual diversity studies at the University of Toronto. And I'm also a consent practitioner. So I do things like this where I work with people talking about what consent is, what it can be. Um, very basically, I'm in the midst or at the end of doing my dissertation field work for my PhD, which has involved about 14 months of, of um, qualitative research. So ethnographic field work, participant observation and informal interviews. And it's um, through working at some of the different locations I've been at. So um, these day centers that provide services for folks with intellectual disabilities, who many of you are probably well acquainted with in Montreal and Quebec. It's through some of these sites that I, and some personal connections that I came to know Matthew and was invited to participate and help out with this curriculum development. And my focus in my research has really been about um, how people with intellectual disabilities are um, not given sexual access because of their assumed incapacities, like the inability to consent, um, some of the legal issues that can arise 
around that. Um, so I really focus on consent. It's a big part of, of what I'm doing and, and the stuff I'm talking about every day with people. So we can go. So Monique already mentioned some of this. We just wanted to have a slide where we put some of these goals and terms for, for you to see, for us to reflect on again. Um, and we wanted to note as well that this curriculum is not perfect. So it's important to us to say that we're building this curriculum and we're striving to do certain things, but it's constantly gonna need to be refined and improved upon. But generally these are sort of the, let's say the ethos of how we've been you know, approaching the curriculum development. So consent-based, um, sex positive, meaning, you know, we live in a very sex negative society where sex is very much associated with shame and stigma. So we're really trying to flip that script. Um, an anti-ableist curriculum is very fundamental to us. As I mentioned, sex ed is so often sort of framed around a typical able-bodied person with a brain and a mind that works in very particular ways. So we're being very mindful of that's not always going to work for the folks we're working with. Non-punitive meaning, you know, if someone comes up with an example or an experience in class that has to do with sexuality, that's um, maybe not a great experience. Maybe they've participated in, you know, unhealthy or unhelpful sexual activities our goal or our, our knee-jerk reaction is not to jump to punishment and to shaming, but to instead to sort of a collaborative and generous environment where we can learn together and, and learn safe, you know, have safer skills, safe, safer ways of doing things. And harm reduction is meaning that we know that for many of us, not just our students, but the teachers in the room and the educators here that um, sex, talking about sexuality can be very triggering. Some people might have had um, very difficult experiences, uh, traumatizing experiences. So this relates to consent, right? That we have to feel safe and comfortable saying, um, yes, I wanna teach this. Yes, I feel good doing this. I have the resources that I need. And the same with our students approaching the content, knowing that there's very likely students in the room who have had very bad experiences in this realm. So framing our curriculum, knowing those things. And last, centering the most marginalized. So typically sex ed is very heterosexual, very heteronormative, um, very specific sort of expectations of who we're talking to. Here, we're really trying to center our queer, trans, non-binary, uh, multiply disabled and BIPOC, so black and indigenous and people of color uh, students and folks in our classrooms and the spaces we're in. Like I mentioned, I wanted to have some statistics here in case there were any questions or folks just wanted some more of the data on this as to why this is so important to teach. Um, I won't necessarily read through all of these in detail, but briefly, we know that adults with intellectual disabilities of all genders experience sexual violence at a rate three to seven times, you know, three to seven times higher than the non-disabled population and children will experience sexual violence at four to six 4.6 times um, higher rates. The most difficult thing here for us to be aware of is that perpetrators are usually known to the victim. So it's people like caregivers, support workers, extended family, friends, partners, boyfriends, girlfriends, that kind of thing. So it's not the sort of stranger, um, which is important because we likely know the people that often that this is happening with. Um, and also the, the folks we're working with face very unique challenges when it comes to reporting sexual abuse, mostly that they're not um, understood or taken seriously. So that's something we've thought about a lot in how we do this work. And lastly, we know that sexual violence is underreported. So we have to assume that it's actually happening more than we think it is even based on these statistics. So this is all just to say that it's so important to teach this because all of the research in sexuality studies shows that a key strategy for limiting these problems, limiting these experiences, these negative experiences is through sex education. So that's what we're working with as we move forward. So, and I just wanna, wanted to mention that how great it's been to collaborate with Hannah. And if you can get, you know, access to um, a researcher because Hannah has, you know, she, she's um, uh, doing a lot of the research, right? And generating, the research that's super meaningful and relevant and impactful in our field, but also has um, done the research to sort of see what else is out there. So there's so many questions that 
we've had that Hannah is just like ready with an answer for and to have that resource when you're developing curriculum, um, you know, is really, really magic. So if like this is something you're developing and so I have to remind myself all the time, like there are experts in this stuff, you know, like we have the field experience, but there are also folks out there who study these things. And if we can connect with them, you know, that can be really, really powerful. And um, and Hannah gets to, you know, have a, uh, you know, a great community to work with on her end that ends up being part of her research. So it's a really, um, you know, a great collaborative relationship. So um, I want to talk to you about the documents uh, for students and families that we've generated. So when teaching sexuality, right, communication is absolutely key. Um, to me, that's a lot about, you know, a lot of what this is all about. So we are um, clear and super transparent with all our students about what we're doing, but also with their families, right? Our students are adults, but we know that um, their, their parents, caregivers, siblings often are very involved in supporting them in their lives in some way. So we make sure that we're clear with them as well in terms of our pedagogical intentions and goals. And being sort of forthright of that has so far proven beneficial. Um, so I'm going to share four documents here really quickly. I'm not going to go over them in detail. Um, I will be making all of this a bit available to you tomorrow in addition to some bonus resources. And so you'll get an email follow up with all of this. Uh, so you can really, you know, um, have a close look. But I just want to give you a sense of uh, the documents we've prepared for staff, but that we we're also sending home to families as well. So I'll start with this letter home. So this is just a, a, a note that we wrote um, to families given the context for why we're doing this. We list um, the themes that we're covering. So there are no surprises here at all. Okay, and so what you can expect if you send home a similar letter is you'll probably get some responses some, from some parents, right? Um, such as, I'll give you some examples here, some things we've um, seen right away. And we don't have all the answers to, but um, uh, Kira had the idea of putting together this, this FAQ section, right? So these are like real um, questions that we're getting and we wanna make sure that our teachers are ready with um, some answers. And this is like an open shareable document. So we get folks like adding suggestions all the time. You know, so parents will worry that we're opening the Pandora's box of sexuality. Everyone's gonna be pansexual and having orgies in the street. You know, so no, we have, that's not what we're going at here. That's not going to happen. Um, we, here, here are some answers for sort of fielding that one. Um, our student is not interested. Um, they don't need to know about sex. Um, they are, there's concerns that we're teaching, that we're promoting premarital sex, um, and that's not moral. So we have responses for that. Um, also religious cultural objections. Uh, folks want to see the curriculum to which we're like, here you go. Um, and uh, also, th this one was really interesting. Um, folks who've had prob like, um, problems with inappropriate behaviors in the past um, and even involving the law. Um, and we want to you know, uh, be able to address that and explain that, well, maybe if the person had this information in the first place, right? Like we would have been able to avoid some of these, these issues um, uh, you know, uh, beforehand. Um, or the, the idea that the student does ha doesn't have a high enough e IQ or somehow isn't equipped to have these discussions or be a, a sexual person. So these are just some of the, the, the FAQs that we are, we're coming up with. Um, I can say personally that whenever I get like a challenging parent um, in this situation so far, like they kind of um, are probably assuming that we're going to promote that students go out and have sex. And then as a, an educator, I'm like, oh, the parent is probably wanting to like pull the student from the program. And then when you meet, and have a discussion, that's not the case. They just wanna be heard, they wanna share their concerns, and um, it gives you an opportunity just to reassure them and say, no, these are really the things that we're you know, gonna be dealing with and it's, not, it's probably not what you think. So the dialogue, the communication is key. We also um, generated um, our summative checklist. So to give you some um, context for this checklist, it's pulled right from the ministry curriculum. And I'm going to say a, a, a point in a moment about the learning and evaluation situations model that we use. But this is what we're evaluating. We took the ministry objectives and we turned them into I can statements, okay, because we find that that's a little more like impactful for the student and meaningful for the student. And um, because the curriculum like isn't super new, uh, there wasn't a section on consent. So we added the, 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 the theme of consent uh, into the uh, summative checklist. Okay, um, so there's one for minimal autonomy and one for functional autonomy. Okay, and you're free to use these um, as well. I'll be making them available to you. Okay, so this is ultimately what becomes the student's report card. And then finally, 
there is a glossary. Um, it is very comprehensive, um, but uh, just really, really uh, great to familiarize yourself with. Okay, and all the terms in here and uh, you know approaches sort of inform uh, the way that we're teaching sex ed at our center. Okay. Um, so those are the documents that our teachers uh, have on hand and the letter home uh, and the summative checklists uh, we, we send home to parents and caregivers. So as I mentioned, we use a learning and evaluation situations uh, model for curriculum de delivery. Um, and, and a learning eva and eva evaluation situation or LES is just a unit plan, right? Um, so it includes everything you need to teach your students and what they what they will learn and how you will assess them. At, at Endeavor, we release teachers to develop learning evaluation situations for every field of skill. So every subject in social integration before the teachers teach it. So what you're about to see, all of the teachers um, are provided with in advance of actually teaching. And then it's up to them to sort of break it down further and adapt as needed um, or bring it back to the team, say, this is what worked, this didn't, and then we tweak from there. So um, each of our teachers uh, involved in this project is gonna present an LES um, to you today. So we have four LESs um, or four unit plans for uh, sexuality. There's one on um, consent and sexual activity. That's a little bit uh, more of a challenge to get into. I'd say it's one of the, the more heav the heavier LESs and we're not done it yet. But we are planning for a follow-up workshop to this one where we will present that LES uh, to you then. But we do have three completed LESs that um, as of tomorrow, when I send them to you, you'll be free to use them right away. And our teachers are actually like um, using them right now. So um, it'll be interesting to get an update on how these are going, uh, you know, a couple of weeks down the line. So um, I'll continue to share my screen and the teachers are going to take you through this. So uh, Monique, you're up. All right. So yeah, as Matthew mentioned, we uh, break down our curriculum into LESs and I'm going to talk about number one, consent and healthy relationships with others. So as we mentioned, we uh, really wanted our teachers to contribute to this. We took a poll um, finding out what types of themes they believe their students needed to know about the most what they're comfortable addressing. Um, we asked them all and they were so generous in uh, responding to our, our Google form requests and we got lots of great information. So this first LES was really considering um, that this is like an opening to a, a very large topic that we really wanted everyone to feel safe um, addressing and talking about with their students. So yes, the theme is consent. Um, and so we wanted to make sure that before we moved on into um, like anatomy or intimacy, that everyone understood the various forms of consent. So for us, consent is, as I said, not just about sex, it guides and governs all kinds of communications and interactions. So taking time to really break down what that means for our students in situations that are real to them, that they understand. So a lot of um, our lessons are designed based on what teachers are actually hearing in the classroom, which is pretty cool that we had the opportunity to take those uh, suggestions and really build them in. Um, we use scenarios to kind of present the students with situations to think about. And then we um, offer lots of resources for the teachers to access according to the levels of their students' um, understanding and just dig into the topic, have lots of discussions with some help from uh, YouTube videos. We got, um, yeah, so more than YouTube videos, sorry, I'm blanking for a minute. We compiled a, a list of books that are really awesome for everyone. One thing we did find, of course, was that some of the content we needed to use was for children. Um, so we really tried not to go too far into that area, um, but some of the preteen, teenage puberty content that we found would be more um, suitable for our students. So we compiled it all and we've uh, provided it in our LES. So I just wanted to highlight a couple of activities. Um, and also I should point out before that, we really wanted to emphasize 
um, and help our students recognize situations in which they may have been coerced um, or coercion maybe exists and hopefully help them to advocate for themselves. So that's what the, the, the theme overall of this LES is. Um, so yes, opening, understanding what consent means. Um, we had a suggestion from a special ed tech in our program actually for a question box activity. So um, I think it's a little further down there, um, Matthew, I can just explain. We wanted to give our students the opportunity to ask questions anonymously. Um, and so the idea is you set up a box with your class and um, make it fun, maybe decorate it. And if your students are not readers or writers, there's ways we can adapt a questionnaire that we can hand out at the end of the day. Everybody fills one out. Um, this is just the document explaining the activity. Um, so it's very, everything is linked in the doc, which is so awesome because if you're trying to plan a lesson and you're not comfortable with something or there's just so many options for everyone to to look through and pick what's best for them so yeah all kinds of stuff like that um and then oh another thing that really was a great idea for creating like a safe environment for everyone teachers included um was the idea of coming up with a, a sort of like a classroom agreement oh this is our consent wheel. Yeah, that's pretty fun. Stephanie who gave on that. Um, so yes, a, a, a classroom agreement that where everyone, before you start out down this road, everyone has a chance to say, I'm okay with this. I'm not okay with that, right? So you make a list together as a class so that everyone understands where the boundaries exist, um, what's okay with everyone and um, so that you know, the conversations can, can, can keep going without anyone feeling like hedged out of them or unsafe at any time. So that's LES1, it's really laying the groundwork for moving forward. And that's where we're all about to get started too, so. Awesome, thank you. So for LES2, this will focus on consent, anatomy and bodily autonomy. So we designed this LES or unit plan to instill in students um, a sense of bodily autonomy and as it relates to consent and anatomy. You'll see that all of our LESs or unit plans are linked back to consent because we found that that was just such an important component to, to follow throughout. So um, it's important for students to know the appropriate vocabulary uh, that relates to their bodies and to be able to identify different parts of their bodies. Um, and we also want to reinforce that their bodies belong to them and that they have the power to decide uh, about their body parts being shown or touched. And you'll see that we talk about even in medical settings um, with friends, family members, we really want to instill bodily autonomy and we want to give them the vocabulary necessary to advocate for themselves. So we can jump into LES2 if it's linked. So I'll go over the problem situation quick. Um, so for each LES, we do have a problem situation that kind of uh, informs what the LES will focus on. So this one uh, says, whether at home, at school, or within health and social services, we and our students are often subjected to various forms of touch or discussion with which we may not be comfortable without the appropriate information or cues. So we need to remind ourselves and clarify for our students that professionals, teachers, and caregivers must seek consent and ask questions and that their students have the right to refuse either. So this is the basis and the situation that um, all our activities and lessons are going to follow. So we have the assessments. So this is just to gauge what students already know to activate prior knowledge. So they're just a couple YouTube videos of books by author Corey Silverberg. They're really good. They talk about different topics of sexuality and anatomy. So it's a good jumping off point to see where your students might be at and where maybe questions are going to arise and what they're going to need to know for the rest of the LES. Yeah, they're really, they're fun, they're cartoons. So some of the lessons, I'll just go over them quickly and maybe we'll look at one or two um, more in depth. So you'll see there's a circles program, which I'm sure many of us are familiar with. So it's the different circles of where different people in their lives fall into different categories. So they're in the middle and then friends or family would be closer. And then the circles, yeah, exactly, they branch out. And the last circle is strangers. 
So there's going to be a lot of good discussions around that. And it's something that I'm sure a lot of our students have seen before. Um, so there's a social story about what are body parts. So maybe we could take a look at that. Yeah, so this is a more concrete activity to start with. So it gauges students' uh, prior knowledge on private parts, and it starts a new conversation about this new topic. So saying everybody has private parts, um, well, identifying what they are, how you wear clothes, who can see them, who can touch them, all kinds of stuff. I'm sure a lot of questions will come up um, with that activity. And again, it's just a good starting point. So you'll see in a big section, yeah, all that section, um, there are activities that are pulled from the Quebec government sex ed curriculum. So this is a curriculum that was developed for int intellectuals with intellectual and developmental disabilities. This is a resource that we found during Dr. Eno's presentation. So it's a great resource. It's 160 pages. It's linked there in the document. Um, you'll see that there's tons of resources and lessons that were pulled directly from there. We pulled some that are more relevant to anatomy, um, but go, we encourage you to check it out yourself. Um, at the end, you will see right here, yeah, that there is a section and lessons on COVID and getting the vaccine. So because I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, but there were some parents who were interested in having us talk about it and address it. Um, and we figured that since this falls under bodily autonomy and having the information necessary and kind of advocating for themselves and what they're comfortable with, um, we decided to put into LES too. So yeah, so you can see there's a social script all about what they can expect. So yeah, that's LES two in a nutshell and, and everything's linked there for you guys. We, our third learning and evaluation situation uh, covers myths, prejudices, stereotypes, and sexuality. So it's totally fun and breezy. Um, but no, really, this unit sort of delves into the ways that oppression creeps into the daily lives of folks who experience prejudice based on their disabilities, their sexual orientation, and their gender identity. Um, people with intellectual disabilities are so often infantilized or assumed to be asexual. Uh, sexuality only seems to come up in professional conversations. Uh, this team, we have heard the words inappropriate sexual behavior so much uh, over the last months doing this research and curriculum development. And while inappropriate sexual behaviors do exist, it seems like a real uh, disservice to adults with intellectual disabilities to only equate sex with inappropriate. Uh, where's the fun? <laughs> where's the dating and the flirting? Where's the pleasure? So uh, ableism is a real and important part of this conversation. Uh, and we're hoping to develop this unit more. You can see right now there's two words. <laughs> I've got queer pride and gender identity, and those are the two learning activities that currently exist. But um, we have more to do, hopefully with more input from um, self-advocates. So on to the learning and evaluation situation. So the pedagogical intention, the general uh, objective of this learning and evaluation situation is to interpret the myths, the prejudices and stereotypes related to sex or sexual orientation. So the proposed activities in this unit will provide students with real life tools with which to confront and dismantle these myths. So the themes that this covers from the field of skills, it covers physiology, it covers, covers sexual orientation, myths, prejudices, and stereotypes. Great state forward. Uh, one thing that we did um, with the creation of this field of skill was we added a show and tell teacher folder um, because we found that all of this effort would go into creating the LES. And then because we have 10 teachers, something like that, 10 different classes um, of students with various access needs, teachers are all independently creating their own um, activities as needed and there's no central place. So this time, this go around, we created this folder. There's a hyperlink right in the LES and 
people are encouraged to drop in their Jamboards, their slideshows, their relevant YouTube videos that they found, any of their lesson plans, anything that other teachers might be able to use. So because we've, we create this whole um, LES and we want to make sure that it is rich and meaningful for the whole, all of the students in the program. So our problem situation for um, LES3 is that adults with intellectual disabilities face numerous myths, stereotypes, and prejudice when it comes to dating, when it comes to relationship and sexuality. Issues such as ableism, homophobia, transphobia, and racism can impact interpersonal dynamics and affect people's safety. So the two learning activities that we cover are two scenarios. The first one is a Pride Week event. So in Montreal, unlike many other places in North America, Pride Week happens in August. And so the situation is that we wanna have Pride Week at Place Cartier, but we can't have it in August. So we're gonna create our own week. So uh, the students will begin by learning about the Pride flag, um, doing some coloring of the coloring of the various pride flags that exist. Here's an example of one on the, on the LES in front of you with all of the different meanings of the colors of the rainbow. Uh, there's also an activity um, about Marsha P. Johnson, who was one of the first activists arrested at Stonewall, at the Stonewall riots. And we put her in there because we wanted to underpin that um, gay pride was started by people who struggled not only with uh, homophobia, but who were dealing with transphobia and racism. You know, the weekly police raids were a big deal. And so we wanna highlight uh, her. And then if we move on to, oh, and then also there's um, connection there about the local queer resources in the West Island. To, provide more resources for students who may need them. We can't assume, we don't wanna assume, you know, there, there might be students who, who could make use of those services. Uh, the second activity is about gender identity. Um, the scenario is that uh, we're moving to a new school. We will be, not this in a couple of years, and we will have gender neutral bathrooms. So the activity is the students are to learn all about gender identity, who has one, we all do, and um, create a slideshow to be presented during the previous Pride Week, um, talking about the various gender identities. And yeah, that's it. So I'm very aware of time, so I'm going to stop there. Uh, Thanks, Kira. Um, I'm, I'm just going to click on Julian is a Mermaid because this is a book that you all should no, no about. Um, anyways, uh, just check out that link when I send you the uh, the uh, the presentation tomorrow. Um, and another feature of our LES is this one we just finished, so we haven't done it yet. But what we do is we highlight all of the different terminal objectives, okay, that you would be assessing that are tied to each one. And so we do our best to make sure that when you've completed all four of the LESs collectively, you will have had enough coverage so that you can assess students and all of the terminal objectives um, highlighted or identified by the Ministry um, of Education. Okay, um, so uh, we have questions in discussion and that'll take us to the end of this. So I just, and we're gonna have time for that. Like it, we have a couple minutes and um, I don't know about folks, but I can stick around a bit past four o'clock uh, for questions and such. Um, so I just wanna go uh, to the last slide, just to make sure I give you all the information, and then we'll open the, the mics and questions, concerns, comments, tips, whatever. Um, and in terms of feedback of what you would like in a follow-up workshop, um, sometime hopefully in, in May, uh, I'm going to send a form out tomorrow, okay? So you'll have that to give us feedback on today, but also to, you know, what you would want more of in a second workshop. Uh, the future workshop would not be um, us talking at you the whole time. It would be much more interactive, questions, comments, your experiences, things you've encountered, that sort of thing, okay? Um, so let me just, um, so 
when you we weren't going to present this today because we knew we wouldn't be able to fin finish it in or i thought we could and then monique said no that's not going to happen and she was right of course so um we've included uh, strategies resources that we got like just from isabel a no next week that we want you to have um, we keep talking about her there she is um she has a clinic for folks with asd and asperger's and she deals a lot with like relationships sexuality like that is her thing um and she is one of the experts so these resources um these notes are all from the conference and you're free to check them out on your own time once i provide you with the link i'm just scrolling ahead to our thank you here because i want to make sure i don't forget so i just want to thank our team thanks to abby and Rishar for helping us make this happen um, and thanks to all of you for participating. I'm so thrilled. We had over 50 people here. That is amazing. I can't remember the last time I've had, I don't think I've ever been in one space, virtual or otherwise, with that many social integration folks at one time. So I just love that. And I hope we can do more of these things together. Uh, so I'm, I'm just so excited and, 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 and grateful for all of you to take the time today in a pandemic after teaching. Thank you so much. Uh, so I will be in touch tomorrow with the resources with a resource folder uh, for you, um, the LESs and a copy of today's Google Slides presentation. So with that said, um, if you got to go head out, if you can stick around, uh, we're here and we can definitely take questions and have conversations for a few minutes. So if you got to go, thank you. Otherwise, stick around, unmute yourself and let's chat. That was amazing, guys. First of all, I, I can't get over how much work you guys put into every single learning scenario. I'm very impressed. But thank you so much for showing. It's very kind of you guys to be so open um, and sharing your resources with us. We really appreciate it. Thank you, Jen. I'll start then. I have a question because I've had this scenario happen to me on several occasions. Um, you did mention religious point of view. Um, and when we do talk about diversity and the LGB2 community, there are times I do get pet calls from parents um, with concerns about how open we are when we talk about sexuality. Um, I'm curious, my, Matthew, how you deal with parents who are um, not open or comfortable with us discussing this. Um, so, so we haven't um, we haven't encountered that yet, as opposed to uh, in uh, when it comes to um, LGBTQ uh, two plus questions. Um, it's been more around like uh, just general religious. Uh, we suspect religious based objections to premarital sex, and we just basically uh, repeated that you know we're not encouraging students to have premarital sex. We are talking about just sex and any additional context that they'd want to provide they'd have to sort of provide at home so we are sensitive to that and like i said i think it's really just once you have that conversation with folks you know you kind of hear where they're coming from they actually see what it is you're doing and they learn that well really we're just talking about like personal space most of the time and you know folks come around so i don't have a more specific example to draw on for that but thanks for the question hannah's very else? good yeah. at answering these kinds of questions not to put you on the spot. Yeah, Hannah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was just thinking we had, we actually had this conversation about maybe a week or two ago when we started putting together that what to say when document. And I remember one thing we came up with is that um, while within a particular household, these things may not be talked about as much, or there may be a sort of a particular, you know, uh, perspective. Um, students are in the classrooms with other people who may be queer or identify as LGBTQ or non-binary, um, they're exposed to it in television, in you know, the places they're visiting, the people they're surrounded by. So it's still valuable education. Um, and I think for me stressing that we know that it is not just higher rates of sexual violence among intellectually disabled people, but especially on the, among the most marginalized and in that including queer intellectually disabled people, to me, like really stressing that this is, um, it's a way to prevent those things from happening is, is really important. So I think those maybe two, two different ways of talking about it might be helpful. But like Matthew said, I, I feel what happens is people have sort of knee jerk reactions and sort of stress from maybe like old school sex ed that they remember from their childhood. Um, and then once you really sit down and, and have a conversation and talk through what's what's happening and what is being taught, um, everyone can kind of 
see what what's being done and and the approach is good and then you can have a negotiation right and more of a conversation so I think just being open to the discussion with with parents and caregivers is is really helpful to begin with can I ask what age group this is being uh, geared towards uh, yeah just as I mean uh, the adult population so 16 plus most of our students are 21 and up but yeah uh, so any anyone who's an adult and just to, just to clarify a little further, since if most people are over 18, are there many who would be falling into the category of needing, needing parental consent? Or, or is it something that you, of course, would like to do if somebody's living with family? But is, it, is it something that legally they are obliged to get parent consent or can they make their own decisions? Um, yeah, I, so uh, the letter home certainly isn't to, it's not permission to, to teach this it's just informing folks that we are um, and for anyone who's 16 we would be sending home the same letter um, and uh, like uh, I think it was Monique who mentioned before um, or Hannah that we're you know required to teach sex education like in this province um, even you know um, to kids right it's part of the curriculum but I definitely get the concerns um, Andrea and I think um, that's the kind of thing you can take into account um, because we know our students right and we know their their families and the way that we word and present our letter um, can certainly be tailored in anticipation of some of these, you know, some of the challenges we might face. But in terms of legally, I don't believe we'd have to, um, we, we, we don't need people's permission to be able to teach this, but it's more of like a courtesy, a heads up. And yeah. really to me, it's reaching out. We wanna work with you and your family on this as like a community. A great question. I came from a place that the student themselves, each student needs to know that, that we are reaching out to the family, not because your family really gets this to say an input into your life, but just because to have, you know, to have greater and greater circles of comfort. Mm -hmm. People always talk about get out of your comfort zone and I'm not one who uses that. Let, let's <laughs> increase the circles of comfort, right? Because then we have the best experience of life. Thank for you sure. for answering that. I, I think idea. that's, I was just going to say, I think that's a great way of framing it. Um, I think it is important for students to know that the letter is not about um, pursuing parental or caregiver permission, because um, that is just another layer of, of you know, this, those problems of, of sexual access, parental control, infantilization, absolutely. So um, it's something we've talked about. Have you ever sent a letter home about another area of the curriculum? Probably not. So yeah, the wording of that letter was very important to us, um, making sure we were just opening room for dialogue because we're anticipating questions. But yeah, really making sure it wasn't a, a permission slip or looked like one is, is an important factor for sure. I think we should also mention it really depends on the class and who the students are in that particular class. We have some SVI classes where the students are apt to live independently, drive cars. We would absolutely not communicate with their families in that situation. Uh, just a point about the letter. I, I asked, actually, Kira gave me this idea. I read through the letter with my class before sending it home, um, just as a way to open up the discussion. Um, some parents overheard online and then got in touch with me. Um, and when they did, it really was to sit down and have a talk. They just wanted us to hear their concerns, honestly. We didn't have to correct anyone's way of thinking. We didn't set it up in like a judgmental um, way. So it was really, we found it really kind of just smoothed it over. Like they just need us to hear what their fears are and say thank you for sharing that with us. And we're definitely considering that. And um, you know, your student's best interest is in our minds first and foremost. And most parents are very appreciative of just giving that space for a minute to hear about that. So that's what we found so far. The letter is really helpful and just being open with the parents if they reach out to you. Okay, any, any last questions? <laughs> I would love to have another one of these where we just talk about what we're all doing. I don't know if anyone else is game for that, but I, I know. Love yeah. 
I would love to get our PDIG going again, if we can, um, where we, in the previous years, we've met and discussed these things. And I would love to get this group together again in the future to do that, if possible. Do you think that's something uh, we could work out, Matthew and Avi, for the future? No, for sure. For sure. And, and um, like, just, it, it took us so long to get this started, just because, like, at the beginning, when we first met, um, uh, with Hannah, like we just had so many questions and we just had to talk through so many aspects, um, which was, I think a lot of it was just kind of for us preparing for this as like, a, as teachers. Um, and, uh, and, and so, yeah, definitely like some kind of PDIG where you have time to just, you know, be together and, and share questions, concerns, so much comes of that, comes to that. And we're able to return to, uh, to some of those earlier questions we had with like answers we've sort of come up to you come up with ourselves in our discussions right so having that time is just so valuable and we found so we needed a lot more space just to even prepare to begin to teach this than we would when we're say teaching like communication skills right which is really interesting because sexuality is like a very specific field of skill right and yet uh, what we had is so much easier time preparing to teach communication skills or like problem solving skills like that's like the biggest topic in the world right and yet when it came to like sexuality we found we had even more we had to like you know discuss and work out and you know understand before we even got started properly um so yeah no it's definitely creating like opportunities to just like discuss and share and that's what we were hoping that you know the the next app like core could be a lot more about like just sharing what what successes have you had in the classroom? Um, what examples, you know, while of course respecting confidentiality, can we can we share, you know, of success stories or challenges or maybe a time where we didn't do the right thing or, you know, in hindsight we could have had a different approach, right? Um, or how we, we or what would we do next time we taught the same field, right? So, I'd love to have that, you know, opportunity in that space to have these discussions. That's great, Matthew. Thank you. Um, yeah, I think we could definitely do another one of these in a month where we do break into groups and, and really work out more details about this if, if you guys are interested. I think that's a great idea. Yeah, for sure. With with Avi and Richard's uh, talent and skills, we can have uh, breakout rooms and, and, and uh, you know, uh, we found that today we want to have everyone together just to get acquainted and you know it's a bit it's a bit less intimidating but now that we're a little more comfortable uh, we've gone there we've had the discussion we've we've talked about the topic we'd be able to have breakout rooms small group discussions um even you know share a little bit about our our, our centers right so i think that would be really that's a great a, a great idea for next time jen i love it all right well i think that just about does it um thank you everyone for your attention uh, thank you for coming. This has been so great. I really, truly look forward to more Apply Core with uh, you all uh, in the coming months. Thank you so much. And thanks again, Richard and Avi, for the support and for our presenters.